Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Best regards from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thanks for inviting me uh, to this conference. So my presentation will be devoted to risk quantification in complex projects. Uh, it is based on my recent book published by Oxford University Press. Major topics. Uh, we will consider first reasons for failure of project risk quantification, and uh, we will consider some examples of that. Uh, we will discuss uh, shortcomings uh, of parametric and probabilistic risk models, and uh, this discussion will be supported by a statistical framework uh, based on consideration of random and systematic errors. Uh, a role of bias is very important, and we will uh, sp spend some time to discuss this topic as well. Then we will move on and uh, start considering uh, complexity using uh, some uh, very valuable frameworks. First of all, we will consider four types of projects uh, as simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. Uh, it will be very uh, practically useful to tell a part project structure subsystem and project delivery subsystem of uh, a given project. And then we will consider possible uh, mismatches between two subsystems and uh, consequences. Actually, uh, if there are uh, PSS and PDS mismatches in a project system, there will be interesting effects like uh, uh, important and uh, intensive uh, risk uh, interactions. And we will consider three types of inter risk interactions in this presentation, uh, which are internal risk amplification, uh, knock-on interactions, and risk compounding. And we will come up with three types of corresponding bow tie diagrams. Uh, that will be required to quantify uh, instances of uh, those three types of uh, risk interactions. And then we will use those uh, mathematical expressions uh, to build uh, nonlinear Monte Carlo models. But we will start with uh, a regular linear case uh, of uh, integrated cost and schedule risk analysis, which is uh, a kind of uh, standard in the industry so far. And after that, we will uh, move on and uh, we will develop a linear version of integrated cost and schedule risk analysis. And uh, we will consider uh, a particular business case of so-called project zimbalanity. It's about uh, a project in the Russian Arctic, actually, on Nova Zemlya, just uh, for show. Uh, and uh, there will be two instances of that project, linear case and uh, non-linear case. And, uh, after that, we will consider results uh, and discuss implications of uh, using nonlinear Monte Carlo modeling. One spin off topic will be about um, uh, how projects become chaotic. And we will uh, discuss a so called single failure mode mechanism when one or maybe a very uh, small uh, group of risks, uh, they are responsible for chaotization of uh, a project. And uh, we will come up with a kind of model of uh, moving to chaos, uh, which will be based on two big uh, distributions. And finally, uh, there will be a couple of slides of uh, on uh, system dynamic modeling, uh, which might be considered as a complementary or alternative uh, risk quantification method. So let's start with some examples of uh, project delays and uh, overspending. You, you can find a lot of them in the literature, actually. I will come up with one uh, slide, which is uh, from my book. And uh, this is about uh, 400 uh, completed projects. And uh, most of them were actually delayed and distribution is quite skewed. And parameter one corresponds to uh, approved durations when project actually met uh, the approved targets. But most of them, as you see, they were late and the delay might be 100%, 200%, and so on. There are also um, many examples about uh, overspending and uh, you can find them in the literature. I will just come up with two uh, examples. It is Sydney Opera House with 1,400% uh, uh, cost overrun and Boston uh, Big Dick Artery Tunnel which is uh, characterized uh, by 220% cost overrun. And uh, there you can even find a sort of uh, iron law of mega projects uh, in the literature. 
it says that mega projects uh, they are over budget over time and benefit over and over again. Uh, let's consider uh, the uh, statistical uh, framework that will help us out to evaluate random and systematic errors of uh, risk quantification methods. It's applicable to any type of me method, actually. So we have here uh, two parameters like precision and uh, accuracy and four situations, four quadrants. Uh, first quadrant A uh, is characterized by low uh, random error and low systematic error. Uh, this is uh, quite uh, ideal, uh, ideal or maybe utopian case when uh, the risk exposure is not that significant and uh, the method used for risk quantification is quite ideal. More practical would be a, a case B when uh, the risk exposure, which is characterized by random error, uh, is quite high and uh, that's why the width of that distribution is quite big. Uh, there are two other cases, uh, case C and uh, case D. Uh, case C uh, shows what happens when random error is uh, quite low, but systematic error is very high. It means that uh, given a given risk quantification method is irrelevant to a given risk quantification exercise, the results will be way outside of the uh, range of actual possible actual outcomes. And the last case, uh, quadrant D, is uh, characterized by very high systematic error and very high random error. But the result is the same. The method is not efficient. It does not uh, cover the actual project outcome. So uh, well, let's consider shortcoming of uh, regression-based risk quantification methods first. Uh, actually, uh, the major shortcoming is uh, related to uh, proclivity to use uh, convenience and judgment uh, symbols or databases. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, you need to tweak uh, your database in order to make it relevant because the number of relevant projects in a particular database might be very low, but it's easy to get it. It's, it's convenience. And uh, when you, you start tweaking uh, the database, it's a judgment part. You probably remember that saying that there is a lie, big lie, and uh, there is statistics. Technical reason for that statement would be uh, a proclivity to overuse convenience and judgment databases. And of course, uh, if you consider a particular database that was collected, say, last century, and you consider oil and gas projects, for instance, in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, you try to predict an outcome over upcoming project in the Russian Arctic, uh, it will be very difficult to expect uh, that the result will be uh, adequate. Uh, and uh, as everybody knows, uh, recently oil and gas industry uh, was uh, uh, developed in a way to optimize major processes uh, and uh, major uh, methods used, like new drilling methods, standardization and uh, design, modularization, prefabrication, new materials like uh, uh, new types of pipelines uh, using uh, uh, not metal but some different materials and uh, we use still uh, if you use still a last century databases that couldn't take into account those new developments the uh, outcomes will be questionable uh, and of course when you build the uh, regression based methods uh, you need to tweak the uh, regression coefficients to convince people that the regression analysis is uh, quite relevant to upcoming projects. You use bell-shaped, uh, not skewed uh, distributions and so on. Uh, one of the examples of uh, convenience and judgment samples uh, is Dow Jones, Dow Jones uh, Industrial Index. Uh, this is a perfect example, example of convenience and judgment sampling because there is uh, a kind of 100 uh, year growth uh, of this index and everybody is impressed but uh, what is forgotten very often uh, that failed companies are replaced every now and then and recently several companies were replaced uh, just this year now let's consider shortcoming of monte carlo method uh, mostly it is about missed risk factors uh, we can start with the first uh, Monte Carlo method, which is uh, range estimating. It, is, it could be about um, 
activity ranging in scheduling and uh, line item ranging in uh, uh, as, uh, in estimating. And uh, actually, uh, all general uncertainties are taken in, into account, but uncertain events and sch schedule driven costs and uh, uh, risk interactions, they are missed. Schedule risk analysis, the traditional one, it's, 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 it's better because it takes into account uncertain events, but still uh, there are no uh, risk interactions. Cost risk analysis is secondary to sc uh, schedule risk analysis uh, because uh, schedule driven costs should be taken into account. And in uh, traditional cost risk analysis, standalone uh, cost risk analysis, schedule driven costs are missed. Uh, linear integrated schedule risk analysis, which is the uh, sort of uh, standard in the industry so far, it's much better, but uh, still uh, risk interactions are not taken into account. And if we consider uh, nonlinear schedule risk analysis, it's pretty good. Uh, it might be done as a standalone exercise uh, because uh, nonlinear uh, SRA will take into account risk interactions, uh, but uh, schedule-driven costs are not required or irrelevant. Uh, same time, nonlinear cost risk analysis uh, won't be uh, good enough if it's done without schedule risk analysis because schedule-driven costs are missed out. And uh, what we will be talking about uh, in this presentation, uh, nonlinear integrated schedule and cost risk analysis, which takes into account all four major risk exposure factors. Now, a role of bias, uh, that's quite substantial. Uh, first of all, uh, the role of bias might be uh, demonstrated during the methods uh, selection. And there are five or six major bias types. And uh, we can start with channel uh, vision bias when uh, misunderstanding of particular methods may take place and uh, it means uh, it's not applicable to a particular project or a project in a particular phase. Then there is a sort of anchoring bias when uh, the same method, uh, which was learned many years ago, like uh, ranging method, is still used. And the uh, most alarming part is that younger risk analysts, uh, they actually prefer to use that simplified uh, method. Commercial bias is when you have a proprietary tool or a database and try to sell it and uh, believe or try to convince people that this is the best method because of commercial reasons. Survival bias is a quite interesting uh, type of bias when a uh, very simple method, like a uh, ranging method, for instance, is uh, promoted because their clients, uh, the stake stakeholders, they understand uh, the simplified method, they don't understand more complicated uh, methods like uh, integrated cost and schedule risk analysis or something else. And uh, besides uh, activity ranging or uh, line item ranging, we can come up with uh, the so called 10% syndrome. That's a kind of term in the literature about uh, a situation when uh, the same contingency is applicable across the board everywhere for every project. And uh, it's called uh, predetermined uh, red lines, probably by AAC, when uh, the same 10% 10, 10 uh, is applicable for the last three estimates uh, during final investment decision. But once again, the better term for that is 10% syndrome. Marketing bias uh, when uh, happens when uh, a particular tool is promoted by a particular producer uh, as the only true and uh, only relevant one to any project and uh, forget about any other tools because uh, we believe our tool is the best. You can uh, go to LinkedIn and see those advertising notes every day. And the most notorious bias is uh, Bahram DPT bias. Uh, that's a kind of term that came from Indian culture. And uh, that's when uh, powerful people try to suppress new methods or better methods because they compete with their, with their methods they prefer. And uh, I was in science for 11 years and I, I observed uh, the Behram DPD bias. But uh, you know what? Uh, this type of bias is quite usual in uh, risk management as well, unfortunately. Uh, conscience bias in decision making. That's uh, what is in, called in literature hiding hand bias. Uh, uh, that happens when um, decision makers 
try to ignore particular realization of risks. And uh, that is done usually to make a particular project uh, attractive to decision makers. Unfortunately, it happens quite often. So what does it mean? It means that if you come up with uh, the best possible, most adequate risk quantification method, decision makers might ignore the results. And that's why we can call uh, risk quantification a branch of political mathematics by obvious reasons. Now let's move on and go to the second major topic, which is about um, complexity. First of all, we will consider structural complexity, which is about number of project parts and their interactions. Parts means uh, locations, uh, uh, facilities that are uh, thought uh, for this, the particular project, new technologies, uh, subcontractors, and so on. All of and including, by the way, stakeholders as well. And uh, the number of parts uh, may be low, relatively low for a given company, or maybe relatively high, and they interact usually. And uh, uh, in literature, you can come up with uh, a list of uh, major types of interactions uh, between the parts. You can find it. They are pooled interactions, sequential and reciprocal. Uh, pooled interactions, uh, they actually belong to the parts. They happen inter inside of those parts, project parts. Sequential, uh, that's when uh, the results of those interactions, uh, sequential uh, interactions will become inputs to some other parts and uh, down the line and effect uh, parts down the line. And reciprocal, when um, there are mutual inputs of parts. So types of projects, uh, according to the classification, uh, which is uh, uh, maybe found uh, in the literature, there are four major types of projects. Simple projects, uh, there are no interactions or only pooled internal interactions in parts of the, the project. Complicated when pooled and some sequential interactions uh, exist between uh, among the parts and complex when all three types of interactions uh, actually exist among multiple project parts and chaotic uh, should be considered as a limited case of complex projects. So uh, we already mentioned uh, two types of sub uh, systems in in a project which uh, which are project structure subsystems and uh, project delivery subsystems. We just considered uh, the uh, PSS, uh, which is about uh, parts and their interactions, but there is a second a very important uh, subsystem, which is about delivery of a particular project. And uh, uh, it's about project team and uh, it's about people uh, who are members uh, of the team and uh, actual procedures that should be implemented by those people. There might be gaps in um, experience or qualification of those people and there might be gaps in uh, procedures when we are talking about procedures uh, we should keep in mind even unwritten procedures or practices that uh, are not documented at all but used so what happens if uh, there is a pss and pts mismatch uh, something interesting might happen according to this chart and we will consider some consequences the consequences of this uh, there are two major types of PSS and PDS uh, mismatches. First of all, it's uh, a static type. Uh, we are talking here about long-term chronic project system issues. It's almost medical term, but uh, it's about uh, long-term issues that uh, belong to mostly to project delivery subsystem, but it might be part of PSS as well. And dynamic uh, mismatches they might occur if uh, uh, a particular risk happens or risk uh, start interacting and uh, uh, a risk uh, may uh, that might occur they propagate in uh, and interact in the project system due to parts interactions it's the same vehicle as uh, part interact uh, the same vehicle used for interactions of risks so uh, we already mentioned the three types of interactions, pooled, uh, sequential, and reciprocal. But for the purpose of our discussion, we will use uh, slightly different terms related only to risk interactions. And uh, they are called internal amplification of risks, uh, knock-on interactions, and compounding. And uh, uh, internal risk amplifications, it's a static type of um, 
mismatch and uh, knock-on and compounding, they are cross-risk interactions that because they need more than one risk, right? And uh, they are dynamic uh, types of mismatches. And some examples, uh, for instance, a chronic issue, a given, is uh, may happen when the project team is lacking experience uh, process or piping engineers. Uh, and uh, it means that uh, any uh, engineer risk will be exacerbated. You just can think about two different project teams with the two different uh, uh, engineering uh, disciplines and uh, people. And you can come up with uh, observation that uh, engineer risk will be their consequences will, will be quite different. That's because of different uh, internal amplification of uh, corresponding engineering risks. Knock on interactions, uh, for instance, uh, there is an error and emission. Uh, this is risk one, and it is not detected uh, in the engineering discipline, and uh, eventually it might pop up and discovered somewhere in construction or even in startup. And it means that any uh, startup failure risk will be exacerbated and uh, will be much, conse consequences will be much higher. And uh, knock on interactions are mostly about uh, delayed discovery of quality risks. Uh, compounding uh, two, two risks, for instance, errors and emissions uh, and engineering, uh, in engineering and missed uh, external stakeholder requirements, risk number two. If they happen simultaneously, there will be multiple instances of rework and uh, the consequences of two combined risks will be much higher than uh, the consequences, consequences of two standalone risks. So even uh, standalone risk uh, can induce dynamic uh, mismatch, uh, and this is part of traditional linear case. To, uh, before we consider the statement in detail, let's consider a couple of or three uh, medical examples. Uh, not uh, directly relevant to project risk management, but uh, there is an analogy with COVID-19 uh, examples. Chronic issues, uh, this is exactly a medical term now, uh, when two people uh, could have pretty much the same uh, uh, probability uh, to contract uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, due to difference in their uh, immune system status, uh, the uh, consequences might be quite different. Uh, no con interaction uh, if uh, there is a risk um, to contract COVID-19, the, there might be complications. It might be related to cardiovascular uh, system or something else. And uh, this is a knock on interaction complications. Risk compounding, uh, yeah, there might be several examples of that uh, related to COVID-19, but uh, in this particular case, we can consider a contracting of COVID-19 and a regular few simultaneously. The consequences of that compounding might be not very good. So, but uh, those types of uh, interactions, uh, despite they are quite well known in medicine, they are not uh, actually paid due attention to in uh, risk management. Oh, now let's go back to the statement that uh, a standalone risk might lead to a dynamic PSS, PDS mismatch. So you, everybody remembers the traditional bow tie diagram when we have causes, a risk event, and then impacts on cost schedule, reputation, safety, environment, and so on. Here we will consider only cost and schedule impacts. So what happens uh, if uh, there is a standalone risk? Uh, uh, it, it occurs in the project. Uh, so what happens immediately? You may discover that you need to do a rework. And this is impact on uh, PSS, on structure of the project. And uh, we may talk about new work. We can uh, talk about adjustment of finished work. We can scrap uh, finished work or we can scrap unfinished, we can scrap unfinished work. This is the rework part. At the same time, uh, there might be uh, work constraints. That's a quite important uh, concept. Uh, what might happen if uh, there is a risk happening immediately? Uh, a project manager might discover a lack of required information. Just uh, you need to rework your drawings or data sheets or, uh, I don't know, some other documents. Uh, there may be lack of... Um, 
uh, labor, required labor, maybe you, you don't need uh, welders, you might need electricians because of risk and so on. There might be a lack of uh, materials required uh, to do uh, a particular, to address a particular work, and there might be a lack of particular construction or other equipment. And of course, you might uh, need some uh, permits uh, that might be not available immediately. So this is a, a dynamic mismatch between uh, project uh, structure system, subsystem, and project delivery subsystem. Of course, uh, ADPM will come up with uh, immediate band-aid solution as an out-of-sequence work, but usually along with rework and uh, work constraints, uh, out-of-sequence work uh, usually needs to schedule pressure, uh, lower quality of works uh, over time and so on. And after that, uh, it, it would be uh, quite logical to discover low productivity of uh, works because of that mismatch. And uh, then uh, the uh, impact on schedule and cost will be certainly discovered. And this is uh, the standard situation which is uh, applicable to traditional uh, Monte Carlo models or traditional uh, scoring methods. And uh, the risk is uh, uh, considered as a product of probability and impact. Uh, this is uh, risk consequences in any case. What happens if there is uh, a static uh, or chronic PSS-PDS mismatch? Uh, actually, uh, this is uh, a kind of assumption that um, such a cause will lead to nonlinear uh, impacts on uh, schedule and cost. And in this case, uh, we will have different mathematical expression for, for the risk. It will be uh, uh, multiplied by uh, a kind of expression one plus beta multiplied by risk itself. And beta is called a nonlinear internal amplification parameter. Uh, what happens if uh, there is a dynamic knock-on mismatch? It means that um, up the line, there is a quality risk, uh, which becomes uh, uh, cause D for uh, the down the line risk. And uh, this is a dynamic PSS PDS mismatch, which uh, will impact the uh, uh, down the line risk. And it's similar to amplification, but the reason for that is no con interaction actually. And in this case, uh, the mathematical expression that uh, describes this instance uh, of this knock-on interaction uh, is uh, cross uh, expression where beta uh, is actually cross uh, parameter which links uh, risk two and risk one. And this is called nonlinear knock-on uh, parameter. Uh, the last situation uh, happens if you have dynamic compounding uh, mismatch. Uh, the cause C in this case uh, actually points to a possibility that two risks, uh, risk one and risk two, might happen simultaneously. And their compounding uh, consequences will be higher than uh, consequence, some of consequences of two standalone risks. And as you see, compounding uh, will be described by quite complicated mathematical expression uh, where beta one and two and the beta two and one, they actually uh, describe the impacts of a particular of two risks on each other. And uh, the resulting consequences uh, will be much higher uh, in comparison with the case if those two risks will happen, would happen uh, as a standalone risks. So now let's go uh, to and move on to the uh, third part of my presentation. Uh, which is about uh, a particular uh, Monte Carlo model. So initially we will consider a standard uh, linear uh, integrated schedule and cost risk analysis uh, model uh, probably uh, most of you know about, right? And uh, it's called a project Zemblanity, uh, which uh, relates to a fictional uh, project on Novaya Zemlya in Russia, in Russian Arctic with uh, capex about one billion dollars and duration 44 months and we have uh, in this case uh, six uh, non-interacting risks risks are one to r6 
and those risks are considered as a standalone risks, no interactions. Two of them uh, of those risks are quality risks, uh, R3 and R4, and uh, the one of uh, them is about quality risks in engineering, and uh, R4 is about uh, quality risk in construction. So there is a simple simple um, schedule, uh, like level one uh, schedule, with few uh, normal tasks and uh, identified risks. They are actually mapped to those tasks. And the result of that uh, standard uh, linear Monte Carlo model is represented by two curves. One is for uh, duration and the other is for contingency. And uh, yeah, actually we considered uh, those curves after risk addressing there are some addressing actions without addressing uh, the contingency numbers will be a bit higher but as you see nothing unusual 14 percent 12 percent contingency that's what we observe very often in practice when we use uh, linear monte carlo models now let's consider the mathematical expression uh, that came from uh, the bow tie diagrams for three types of interactions. First of all, we use the uh, schedule, uh, which was uh, a basis for a linear model. And we map uh, corresponding risks. Uh, as you see, uh, that's a standard procedure in risk management. But beyond that, we consider uh, risk compounding, which are shown by gray clouds, right? And um, uh, we consider uh, knock-on interactions uh, that are shown by solid lines. Uh, and uh, amplification of risks are not shown because uh, any risk uh, is considered amplified where required. So um, if we consider those interactions and uh, we replace uh, linear expressions for risks, um, to nonlinear expressions uh, for corresponding instances of risk interactions, we will actually get the nonlinear Monte Carlo model. And uh, yeah, of course, there are several steps before uh, where you achieve this result, but uh, including calibration of uh, the Monte Carlo model, and you need to make assessment of better uh, parameters for each type of interactions. But that will be uh, the next slide. So, in order to make the calibration, uh, the calibration of a uh, nonlinear Monte Carlo model, you need to make uh, a qualitative uh, assessment of, of uh, project complexity. And uh, uh, there are two types of project complexity, uh, structural and delivery complexity, as you remember, right? And uh, uh, we tell apart uh, two major parameters for, for uh, the uh, uh, structural complexity, which is a number of parts, as, as you remember, and uh, intensity of interactions. And we have uh, nine uh, situations that actually uh, depict uh, nine cases. Uh, and uh, three of them correspond to simple projects, uh, three of them correspond to complicated projects, and three, uh, they are about complex projects. Chaotic projects, uh, they might be shown here, but uh, not shown uh, for simplicity purposes. They are just limiting case of complex um, projects. Um, in terms of uh, delivery complexity, we also have two parameters here, quality of procedures and uh, uh, procedures implementation. It's about, as you remember from previous slides, it's about uh, many of your project, uh, if you have enough talent and uh, experience in your team, and this is about quality of uh, your procedures. And we have uh, three uh, situations in terms of uh, uh, PDS. Uh, it might be quite robust, uh, it might be passable, acceptable, and uh, it might be a weak. Now we need to actually to merge uh, those two uh, frameworks, uh, to marry them, and uh, the result would be the project system maturity evaluation based on evaluation of the two subsystems. And uh, in this case, we have uh, the outcomes of uh, the previous assessments for PSS and PDS. And um, yeah, PDS is uh, robust, uh, passable, or weak, and uh, uh, PSS, uh, simple, complicated, or complex. And uh, together, those parameters can, uh, will uh, bring forward uh, three types of uh, material evaluations. Uh, the system uh, might be mature, it might be ordinary, uh, and it might be immature. 
So this assessment might be done at the uh, project level, right? When you have just one parameter later uh, applicable to all disciplines, to all risks. And uh, this is not quite informative, although it is used for collaboration. We will discuss that uh, soon. Uh, it, uh, the assessment like this might be done locally uh, at uh, discipline level and uh, at the uh, risk level. And uh, th though there will be uh, several betas instead of one project beta, right? And calibration, of course, should be done above the linear case. What does it mean? When you have a uh, linear case, uh, the, the beta, all of them, uh, if it is uh, project level, one beta is equal to zero, or if it is local assessment, all of them should be equal to zero, which will uh, automatically correspond uh, to linear schedule and cost risk analysis case. But as you remember, uh, the uh, that method produced uh, 14 and 12% contingency correspondingly. So how to do calibration? Uh, you are, yes, of course, it's depend, it depends on uh, risk uh, tolerance and uh, uh, it could be different uh, for uh, different companies, but it could be based on this example. When interactions are weak, medium and strong and maturity level is mature, ordinary or immature, there will be two dividers between uh, those three parameters, like 10% and 25%. You can select any other number like 15% or 30% or whatever is uh, required according to the uh, tolerance level. But in this case, uh, those two dividers between those three, among those three uh, situations uh, are 10% and 25%. So if we run uh, the Monte Carlo model uh, with the same beta several times, but different betas every time, we can... Uh, uh, pin down uh, the parameters uh, that will correspond to 10% and 25%. But that will be one uh, parameter of beta that is applicable uh, to the project uh, in general at large. So, of course, uh, the same 10% or 25% might be achieved if you have different parameters at discipline level and uh, in at risk level. So this uh, approach is used uh, for calibration. And uh, in this case, uh, if you know the dividers for uh, weak, medium, and uh, strong cases, uh, and you know the particular numerical numbers from that uh, tentative uh, modeling, you can come up with, uh, you can merge actually qualitative uh, assessment, which was just discussed with a numerical or quantitative uh, assessment of parameters beta. So it might be done during the workshop and uh, it's easy to do. So the result of uh, the uh, nonlinear Monte Carlo model, it's the same uh, Zimblanity uh, project uh, is like that. Uh, as you see, yeah, uh, we have two cases here. Interactions are not addressed first, then interactions are addressed. But uh, the standalone risks are already addressed uh, the same way as in case of uh, linear uh, Monte Carlo model. So those are results for uh, after addressing case for standalone uh, risks. But once again, uh, interactions of risks are considered before and after addressing. And as you see, the contingency for duration is 51% before a risk interaction addressing and 26% uh, after and 55, 54% uh, for costs uh, before uh, interaction addressing and uh, 31 after. So you see that the numbers are much higher, but it depends on uh, parameters uh, better that are uh, discussed uh, during the uh, workshop, right? And uh, the parameters beta might be quite high, and then you will go to the case similar to uh, Sydney Opera House or to Boston Tunnel Project. Uh, the numbers of contingency required might be very, very high. And this method allows to uh, reach that result when uh, there are multiple interactions of risks and multiple chronic issues in the project system. So, uh, one of the last topics uh, related to Monte Carlo is about single failure mode. You can uh, discover in the literature a lot of speculations uh, on uh, chaotization of projects. I won't list uh, all the models, but there are quite a few of them. So, uh, the 
Monte Carlo methodology actually provides some insights why uh, a project, a particular project, might move to chaos abruptly. So uh, usually uh, the prioritization of a project uh, is based on uh, two big distributions. Actually, there is no uh, big uh, difficulty to come up with distribution uh, with three peaks even if required. Uh, but two peaks is typical. Uh, what happens here? Actually, the second peak uh, belongs to uh, one or maybe a small group of uh, risks that have very high sensitivity for project outcomes. And that might happen due to project inter uh, due to risk interactions in the project. So some risks become extremely sensitive uh, regarding the outcome of a particular project. So in this particular case, uh, risk one and two, they have very high sensitivity and uh, they actually uh, stand out out of that list of uh, risks that are shown by this tornado chart. And they actually are responsible for the second peak. So what happens here if uh, risk one or risk two happen, uh, the project immediately jumps uh, to chaos. Uh, it will end up in that second peak, uh, in, in, in the vicinity of that second peak. Uh, what happens if we take uh, risk one and risk two out? Uh, the situation will be uh, normal. Uh, I mean, uh, there will be no second peak and uh, the risk uh, one and risk two that are responsible for prioritization, they are gone. So the uh, curve looks like uh, usual and uh, this is a kind of smooth, smooth distribution and project uh, cost and schedule uh, performance of this project will be slowly deteriorating in the course of this happening, but there is no abrupt uh, jump uh, to chaos. And uh, it's still a complex project, but it's not chaotic. It cannot be, uh, become chaotic in uh, this world. Uh, last topic uh, of this presentation is about system dynamics. Um, it's quite interesting uh, methodology. It's not a mainstream of uh, risk management yet, uh, although there are some works uh, about uh, system dynamics written in the 1980s, maybe even earlier than that. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, system dynamics in project management uh, is based on so-called uh, rework cycle. You have a work to be done or remaining work, and uh, there is a workflow, the number of uh, drawings or construction units done per month, and uh, there is work accomplished. But uh, the problem with this uh, nice picture of the world is that there is a poor quality of some units. And uh, usually quality is not discovered immediately. It might be discovered in several weeks or even months. And uh, the discovery depends uh, on uh, when the poor quality occurred at the beginning of the project or at the middle of the project or by the end of the project. The general concept of that uh, approach is that uh, there might be uh, consequences uh, that will be discovered uh, in later uh, project phases like construction or even in uh, uh, startup. And uh, there is even a term in the industry, in the literature, is called a banquet of consequences when uh, abruptly uh, people discover a whole bunch of quality risks that were not discovered uh, in engineering. And in, in this example, the total um, work is uh, 100 units. Uh, the workflow is five units per, per month and the uh, expected duration apparently is 20 months. And in this uh, model, I put uh, poor quality 20% uh, of units, which is, of course, an exaggeration. And uh, a rework discovery, uh, as I mentioned previously, depends on when it happens, like if it's six months, uh, if it is at the beginning of the project, it will take four months to discover the poor quality at the middle of the project and so on. And the results uh, of that modeling, simple modeling, is quite simple. Uh, instead of 20 months, uh, it will take 26 months uh, because of the rework. And the major culprit for that is uh, the hidden poor quality that will be discovered down the line and the discovery uh, rate 
which is shown uh, at the first uh, graph, right? Uh, it depends uh, on many factors. It's non-linear. And uh, actually, because of the rework, uh, the project will be delayed. Uh, this is quite simple uh, system dynamics uh, model. But let's consider a model that was actually used in my book. Uh, don't be surprised or scared. It's quite complicated, but it's workable and it's possible to upload this model and uh, run using a particular uh, software tool, which is actually available for free. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can read my book about that and find some details. So system dynamics, uh, it actually, uh, this model corresponds to project exemplarity, uh, nonlinear schedule and cost risk analysis model. And I used uh, to rework a cycle model. What does it mean? You have one engineering model, uh, here for cycle, and the second one is uh, construction cycle, and they are actually linked. What does it mean? Uh, the uh, poor quality might be discovered inside of engineering, that is pretty much the same as previous slide, right? But poor quality might go in construction, and that's most notorious case uh, because it will take much more time to discover. Uh, I mean, to discover the poor quality, and it will take much more time to rework everything. Uh, of course, it might be resolved, uh, or it might be resolved in uh, engineering. There will be some changes, and uh, uh, all the changes will be uh, reflected in final drawings. But uh, very often, uh, re engineering will be required. And that's how the rework goes back to square one, which is engineering cycle. And as you see, uh, there are two uh, core quality parameters. They are exactly risks R3 and R4 that were used in uh, Monte Carlo model, uh, but the rest of the risks R1, R2, uh, 5, and 6, they are uh, shown separately. And uh, there are some uh, multipliers. I don't have a uh, possibility or time to discuss this model, but I would like to intrigue you and uh, probably a risk. Uh, Managers should be familiar with that uh, system dynamics approach and uh, even use it in their uh, work. And uh, quality of uh, works is the major foundation for system dynamics modeling. But regular risks like uh, uh, kind of late delivery of uh, materials to the site or rework due to stakeholders, they are part of the model as well. So hopefully you will find it interesting to learn about this model. So some conclusions. Uh, conclusions are quite simple. It's quite preposterous to expect adequate risk quantification if a selected risk quantification method is inadequate. It also is preposterous to expect a robust decision making uh, regarding project uh, contingencies when uh, management succumb to the hiding hand bias. It means they don't want to see results. Uh, that's why we talked about political mathematics, right? So um, the major uh, key missing uh, risk factors uh, that uh, are discovered in uh, linear schedule and cost risk analysis Monte Carlo methods method, uh, they are relating to risk interactions. And this is the major uh, last, I hope, last uh, missing part of modeling. And we need to take uh, into account internal amplification of risks, knock on and compounding interactions. So in a way, uh, the new nonlinear uh, Monte Carlo methodology can be labeled as a revealing hand as opposed to hiding hand. Uh, the problem here is that, uh, yeah, of course, uh, the results of uh, non-linear modeling should be accepted by decision makers. Uh, how it might be done, you can read uh, the methods of that of transparency uh, in my book. But uh, otherwise, uh, the rebuilding hand, hand uh, won't help out because it will be still hiding hand because decision makers might not want to consider the results. And uh, uh, the reason for that is very simple. Some project might not be approved at all. <laughs> so uh, as we discussed previously, uh, the nonlinear uh, methodology allows uh, to discuss even notorious cases as the city open the house or Boston PD. And uh, there is a capacity to 
quantify the risk to such uh, notorious and infamous projects. Uh, although, again, uh, that should be a very unbiased uh, quantification, otherwise a hiding hand will win. Uh, what is most important is addressing of risk uh, interactions. Actually, addressing of them means uh, depriving a complex project of its complexity traits through converting to either complicated or even to simple ones. So all the chronicle issues should be eradicated and uh, it could be achieved through training of people, uh, through hiring of qualified people for, for or by improving of your uh, procedures and so on. And uh, high quality of works is very important because uh, if you have um, barriers uh, on the ways of uh, engineering low quality works, uh, and you block them and don't allow them to move down the line, you will block knock, knock on interactions. <laughs> Compounding is uh, purely, uh, how it might be interesting, it's purely a planning issue. You just need to try to separate risks that might happen simultaneously according to the dynamic uh, pattern that uh, was discussed previously, right? And you, you need to separate them in time and space. But uh, traditional uh, Monte Carlo methodology uh, is still applicable to simple and complicated projects uh, when uh, mature systems are uh, kind of deployed for those projects. And uh, in my book, there, there was an example uh, of a project in Alberta when uh, the project team actually beat the uh, uh, forecast uh, that I made, uh, P50 forecast, and forecast was P42, uh, as I remember. But the project system was very, very mature, and uh, the government supported uh, a particular project. It was CO2 sequestration, actually, project. And there was a grant, and there were no issues with uh, stakeholders at all. I told uh, project team was quite strong, except a few people maybe, and uh, the result was quite encouraging. Uh, the linear Monte Carlo model uh, worked out pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of uh, complex uh, mega projects, they uh, are about uh, that iron law I mentioned previously, uh, that uh, overspending and delays and operational issues happen again and again. So that's why we need the nonlinear Monte Carlo methodology uh, because uh, it might explain even uh, results of very notorious projects uh, similar to uh, Boston D or uh, Opera House, right? By the way, parametric methods, they just uh, purge projects like that as outliers. They are never part of parametric modeling and so on. Uh, system dynamics. Uh, I did not spend uh, too much time on system dynamics, but it's a kind of complementary methodology for Monte Carlo uh, method. It might be used in parallel. Uh, moreover, uh, system dynamics methodology might be used for modeling of Monte Carlo parameters. How to do that? Please read my book. Very final remarks. Uh, of course, several uh, major uh, important topics are not part of my presentation. So I would like to ask you to read my book, which was published uh, earlier this year by Oxford University Press. And uh, topics related to deterministic or traditional uh, linear Monte Carlo methods, they are actually uh, described in my previous book, uh, 2013 book published by John Weil and Sons. I can ac actually uh, uh, come up with uh, some other books uh, on the topic and on linear Monte Carlo methodology and first and foremost uh, by Dr. Hewlett and uh, some other uh, authors. Uh, so uh, in any case, my new book and uh, some other previous books, uh, they are actually upgrades or should be considered as a logical upgrades uh, for, to nonlinear Monte Carlo uh, methodology and uh, they actually uh, need to be used together because uh, the first book is about uh, deterministic methods and uh, linear or non-linear Monte Carlo method cannot be used uh, consistently without a robust deterministic uh, foundation. One other book uh, is uh, published in 2017 by IGI Global. Uh, I was an editor there, I have uh, 21 
articles there, two of them are written by me, but uh, the rest of the articles, uh, they were written by very top risk specialists who are interested. You might be uh, interested also to buy this book. Uh, of course, uh, we cannot afford a uh, question and answer session uh, here because uh, by obvious reasons. So we can uh, conduct a Q&A session uh, via email. You can use my email, which is shown here. And uh, actually, that's it. And thanks for attending my presentation.